So welcome to our third module. This is going to be about the scientific method. Now, I know that many of you have been drilled and tested on what the scientific method is. Um, your notes were really more about you exploring what those different aspects are with designing your own experiment. Um, and if you have questions about that, in class time is definitely going to be the time to do it. Now, to start off with our module, I have some open-ended questions about PFAs. First is, what do you think PFAs are? Um, there's different sources and you can see things within it. So which of these products do you think that you've used sometime in your life that contain PFAs? And then looking at this interactive map where we have military sites, drinking water, and other known sites, um, where do you think it's often that we find PFAs in water? Um, is it urban areas, rural areas, cities? What, where do you think we find PFAs? Um, and today we're going to be thinking about the scientific method and PFAs and a story of Vermont and water quality. So here's our modular overview. Um, I want you to be able to know what the broad components of a scientific method is and what the limitations of environmental studies are. Here are some different thinking questions as we go through this module. So a hypothesis. A hypothesis is basically a testable concept about how a process works. Now, in Bennington, Vermont, which is in southern Vermont, there was a ChemFab facility. ChemFab was known for producing different textiles and materials that had some waterproof um, ability or non-stick ability. And PFAs were used and consumed at ChemFab. So a hypothesis about PFA uh, water contamination might be if PFAs are consumed at the ChemFab plant, we should see elevated levels in drinking water. Now we can test that hypothesis against a null hypothesis, which assumes that there's no difference in these groups. So we would assume that wells around the plant and wells far away from the plant would have no difference in PFOAs or PFAs. Um, a PFA is merely a carbon molecule with all of the hydrogens replaced with fluorines, um, which gives it some pretty unique chemical properties. And you can learn more about that with the cancer.org site in terms of per perfluoroatanic acids, PFOAs. Now, we have a hypothesis. We want to know, does drinking water near or around sites contaminated with PFOAs vary? So we need to collect some data to test our hypothesis. Now there's some different purviews and overviews uh, regarding the scientific method that we need to think about. Replication. How many wells do we need to sample for sites within our area or far away? So replication is really important. Sample size. How many samples do we need to take at those sites? Precision. How does the same well have or not have nearly identical measurements each time? If a site is contaminated, we should be getting roughly the same level of PFOAs in a well site. And if it's changing, that might tell us something about the measurements that we're taking or something going on in the site. And then accuracy. Does what we actually measure represent the real life measurements? And this is really important when we think about testing and calibration and accuracy with the tools that we measure. The more accurate our data, the more likely we're going to be able to understand differences and test our hypothesis. This is a site um, where a plane crashed in the Rutland Regional Airport where they used flame retardants, a type of PFOAs, and they were able to measure to the parts per trillion different wells that were contaminated. So this is really important in terms of these different aspects. Here are the cities with the most contaminated tap waters if you're interested. So we test. We collect data, we sample, we do replicates of each sample, and we look at our data. Now, within that data, we want to have some level of a control group. Now, this is really important in an environmental study where there's many, many different types of factors influencing our data, because we want to really see, does the variables that we're measuring have some effect on the dependent variable? Um, so in Bennington, here's the ChemFab lab we created a control group which were tests, were wells that were tested really far from the lab 
And we use that to sort of understand the differences within wells near the drinking water. Notice this number, 289 out of 454 tested wells have above 20 parts per trillion of PFOAs, which is not a healthy level. So if we are able to see a big difference between our in-group and our control group, that means that we might be able to support our hypothesis. And maybe if we do this many times, start to generate a theory. The theory might be that if PFOAs are used in a facility, water contamination at nearby sites will occur. We have to know that science is a really small incremental step in terms of forming new knowledge. This might be one out of dozens of studies throughout America looking at this problem, and it might take decades to actually establish the relationship between chemfab contamination and water quality. So natural experiments are really important for our environmental science class because we can't simply can create a control group or even an experimental group. We can't go out and ethically spike people's wells with PFOAs to see what is the healthy level and what are the health effects. We have to find environments that already pre-exist that offer groups and treatments that might be multivariable but contain some variation within our independent and dependent variable. Within this site, it was really the proximity to the ChemFab lab and what type of well and how deep your wells were to start seeing what is the effect between proximity and the contamination of water quality. Now the EPA is the government organization that really sets what we call maximum concentration level contaminants. And they do that by looking at health outcomes and populations with the measured results of different types of contaminants in water. Now, here are some problems. A, that is a reactive policy, not a proactive policy, because we have to look at populations that already have units of contaminants and what their toxicities are, and then we can create regulations. Regulations are complicated by companies like ChemFab that don't want to have their products regulated because that's expensive. And furthermore, in this world of unbelievable chemical uh, possibilities, we are constantly creating new synthetic compounds, which we can't easily test and know what their health outcomes are until decades afterwards. If you want to learn more about how the EPA regulates drinking water and contaminants, this is a great link. Now, this is just one more point to make you think about how we can use policy and data and hypotheses to sort of regulate and understand environmental problems. Lead used to be ubiquitous, commonplace throughout society. And in about the 1970s, we began to notice that lead pollution was really bad for human health. So we formed hypotheses about different sources of lead and how toxic they were and how we were able to measure them in blood levels of children between the ages one through five. The idea was that they would accumulate this blood from their parents and from their environment at an early age. So then we can start thinking about how do we ban lead? So maybe we ban it in plumbing, maybe we ban it in gasoline, we establish a law that measures and uh, mandates safe drinking water, we reduce it in food cans, and suddenly we start to see drops in lead. So we can start analyzing how different policies and regulations accumulate in the reduction of maybe a contaminant in the human body or in water. But conclusions are often complex, and they don't often recognize our ability to always consider what are the implications. So subjectivity is really important for environmental studies. What do we think is actually a healthy level of lead? What's our willingness to have lead in our environment? So some things just to know about studies. Again, most observations in environmental science are not controllable. Hypotheses in environmental science often rely on a lack of baseline data because we don't have the data available. We don't have controlled laboratories to do these studies in. There's always going to be some level of subjectivity. What is worse? What is toxic? What is more dangerous? Who gets to decide that? And then the conclusions are often simple and they don't always account for complex interactions. 
I hope this helped in terms of your understanding of module three to give you an update on PFOAs and Vermont. Currently there's legislation allowing residential homeowners to sue companies that contaminate their groundwater. That was not in the books in terms of a law until this example happened in Vermont.